and DVDs would make a fantastic set of gifts for the holidays. Give the meaningful gift of knowledge this year. Make sure to order now to ensure delivery in time for the holidays. Whether your gift is big or small, that isn't as important as making sure that you do give. All of your gifts, big and small, literally help keep the lights on here at Link. So consider donating $75 today, and when you do, we're going to send you this classic Link TV tote bag backed by overwhelming popular demand. It's made of thick, sturdy canvas, and it's reusable, so it's the eco-friendly way to shop. We want to raise $300,000 during this year-end pledge drive. We're counting on you to help send Link into a healthy and prosperous new year. So please, help us reach our goal by calling 1-866-485-8848 or go online to linktv.org slash contribute. Now from all of us here at Link, have a great holiday season. Thank you. What do you make of the fact that the debate in officialdom over Afghanistan now seems to be either let's turn it into another Vietnam, let's keep pouring troops in for one strategic goal or another, or let's pull back to the Joe Biden solution, which is basically airborne death squads. Send in the predators, we'll find out where they are, maybe we'll know, maybe we won't. There'll be a lot of collateral damage, but at least our boys and girls won't be in danger. And those seem to be the permissible contours in Washington of the debate. Massive uh, military intervention with consequent great loss of life or surgical, as they say, military intervention with less loss of life on the side of the interveners, yeah. but probably equal or greater loss of life on the part of the subject population. Yeah. Uh, again, that's, that's correct. But I'm not suggesting that there has been a shift in elite attitudes. There's been a shift in popular attitudes. Uh, so, and uh, when they talk about massive intervention, it doesn't even begin to compare with uh, Vietnam. Uh, I mean, they're talking about maybe 100,000 people. By 1965, when protests started, they were talking about hundreds of thousands, uh, uh, plus you know, 50, 70,000 mercenaries and so on. Uh, so yes, those are the parameters of debate, and it's our fault that those are the parameters. For example, we ought to be pointing out that uh, there's a fundamental problem in the debate in Washington. The relevant voices aren't even being heard. I mean, these decisions should be made by Afghans. We don't have any right to make a decision as between uh, Biden and McChrystal. Uh, it's, uh, and, and it's interesting, on Sunday's New York Times had a full page of what should we do about Afghanistan? Ten different opinions, not a single one of which was by an Afghani person. Yeah, and, and they, you know, they have voices. I mean, for example, there's an Afghan peace movement, pretty significant one. You can find out about it, but you're not going to read about it here. Uh, they have spokespersons, quite eloquent ones, uh, some of them pretty impressive. Uh, the most impressive that I know is a, a woman named uh, Malalai Joya, who's a remarkable woman. She's survived somehow, miraculously, uh, struggling against the Russians, against the uh, Reagan's favorite, the murderous warlords who took over and were so outland outrageous that the population welcomed the Taliban. She struggled against them, uh, struggling against the return of the war warlords, which is essentially the current government. Got elected to parliament uh, with a lot of support. I was quickly thrown out because she denounced the warlords who dominate the government, living underground, you know, protected. But she, she speaks. She's written a book, and it's interesting. She gives talks. And her proposal, which is that of the Afghan peace movement, and maybe that of, for all we know, the large majority of Afghans. No, nobody looks. Uh, it's, it's kind of supported, more or less, by the polls that are taken. But her position is... Uh, Afghanistan needs an invasion, an invasion of schools, uh, hospitals, and roads, not an invasion of guns and tanks. Uh, Afghans will, if given a chance, will work out their problems. Uh, we don't want to, we're, we're subject to uh, an assault from the Taliban, from the warlords, and from the occupying army. And we want to get out of that attack. And, we have to work it out ourselves. 
So help us, but not this way. But that voice is not part of the debate. I'm going to take some of our questions from the audience here at the Commonwealth Club tonight. Um, question asks, can movements like the Green Alternative Energy Movement make a true difference in the world if population continues to grow? And how can we globally ever come to an agreement to stop population growth if that's deemed necessary? There's a lot understood. I mentioned before, not too much is known about human affairs, but something is understood about population growth. There are basically two ways to retard it. One way is the Chinese way, by force, you know, and it's causing them plenty of problems, quite apart from the brutality of it. The other way to solve it is educate women. There's very good evidence that as education of women increases, uh, a population declines, fertility declines, and levels, and sometimes even literally declines. Uh, there are some remarkable examples. Uh, so take, say, India. Uh, one of the poorer provinces in India, Kerala in the south, happens to have a very enlightened government since independence. Uh, we're not allowed to say it here, but it was a communist-led government, so forget that. Cut You're that allowed out. here. Not allowed to say But it was a pretty enlightened government. In fact, when Congress came in, they had to follow pretty much the same policies. Uh, literacy is extremely high. There's education of women. Uh, and fertility has uh, leveled and declined, unlike the rest of India. And it's happening in Europe. It's happening in Japan. It's happening everywhere. If women have options and choices, uh, which they don't have in most of the world, then yes, uh, population levels. In fact, in Europe and Japan, it's even declining. Uh, the, uh, so there are two methods to deal with, uh, with excessive population growth, and I think it's pretty obvious which one we should be pursuing. So I, I don't see that as the major problem. I mean, the ecological pro and environmental problems are enormous, uh, grotesque, in fact. Uh, if the species succeeds in destroying itself, as it may, it'll be either from nuclear weapons or from destruction of the environment. And in both cases, in the case of the environmental uh, uh, threats, again, there are two tendencies in opposite directions. Uh, so compare it again with the 60s. Virtually no concern. There, there was environmental movement was almost nothing. Now it's just a very substantial movement. It's a substantial popular movement pressing pretty hard on uh, uh, green alternatives, uh, cutting down energy waste and so on. Uh, but there's counter tendency, as there always is, uh, the business world. Uh, so uh, uh, just recently, within the last few weeks, the American Petroleum Institute uh, and uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the biggest business lobby and others, uh, an announced, you, know, you can read in the press, that they're inspired by the example of the health insurers who months ago knew that they had won. You know, like front page cover of Business Week in August, uh, health insurers have won. We, we got it. They had a terrific technique which essentially killed the possibility of desperately needed health reform. Uh, they know it's going to tank the economy, but that's somewhere in the future. The personal consequences they don't care about. And, you know, they, they have a, again, not, not that they're bad people. Those are, it's, that's the way the institutions work. Well, the Petroleum Institute and Chamber of Commerce say, we're going to follow that model and try to make sure that no uh, serious uh, uh, energy uh, environmental bills are passed by Congress. Now, there was an interesting split in the Chamber of Commerce. Some uh, energy corporations pulled out and say, we're not going to cooperate with this. You look at who they were, they're the ones who produce nuclear energy. So they'd like to have, uh, you know, tax on fossil fuel use, then they can make more money. They'll kill us some other way, you know. But, uh, uh, and again, let me say, it's important to stress that this, these are not bad people. They're perfectly good people, just like anyone else. But they are working within an institutional framework which requires certain choices. If you don't make those choices, you're out. So the institutions require it. 
In fact, even the law requires it. You have to be committed to maximizing profit and growth in the short term. That's amplified by perverse incentives, like the too-big-to-fail government insurance policy, which is now even bigger than it was before, thanks to the bank bailout and the way the money was distributed, uh, and other perverse inf- like, you know, incentives like uh, 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 tying uh, CEO pay to short-term gain and you know, other structures like that. Let me ask you about another incentive, the peak oil incentive. You're certainly familiar with that uh, theory. If it happens, uh, and you can tell us if you believe it's happening or is going to happen, uh, do you believe that it fatally endangers democracy and would move us inevitably towards nationalist or fascist policies? This is a question from the yeah. audience. Well, you know, in my own feeling, I mean, peak oil will come sooner or later, of course, it's a finite resource, uh, but it's a uh, It's a complex notion. I mean, the real question is not how much oil is underground, but how much can be extracted at an economically feasible price. Now, it's it's pushing the limits now. Uh, Oil uh, extraction is more and more costly and more and more environmentally dangerous because you're going after uh, sources that are harder to use. At some point, it will become impossible to continue, but... Nobody knows how far that point is. Uh, However, from another point of view, we're probably better off if peak oil comes sooner uh, because that will reduce the use of fossil fuels and help preserve an environment for our grandchildren to live in. Uh, So, and business knows this. I mean, take, say, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, They've been... The, the leading deniers of global warming. You read the editorial pages, it uh, you know, makes Rush Limbaugh look like a moderate. But a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, they ran a supplement on the environment, which took a very strong stand on the need for radical uh, uh, measures to try to sustain the environment. In fact, they even called for geoengineering. They said that the measures being considered in Washington aren't enough. Well, you know, there's a reason for that. I mean, these are, after all, the people who own the world. Uh, They don't want their possession destroyed. Uh, So they have mixed motives, too. But it's the population that's going to have to drive this. And in that respect, there has been pretty substantial progress in the last 30, 40 years. Speaking of something the population is going to have to drive, I'm going to change topics with another question from the audience here. This question from the audience, uh, Noam Chomsky, is, do you think that taking money out of politics, fair election, clean money campaigns, is, first of all, possible in this country? And second of all, would it be effective in solving many of our political problems in the United States? I think it wouldn't be easy, because there are a lot of ways to get around any regulations, but it would be possible. Uh, uh, however, and it would certainly have a good effect. I mean, uh, 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 campaign funding is a remarkably good predictor of, of uh, election and also of policy. You can pretty well predict policies by looking at where the campaign funding comes from. There's good political science work on this. Uh, Thomas Ferguson, very fine political science. Uh, a, a economist has done extremely good work on this, and it's convincing. And in fact, we see it right in front of us all the time. So the rate of election of incumbents is overwhelming. It's like 98, 99%. Uh, this is happening at the same time that uh, public attitudes towards approval of Congress is in the low teens. But they're outspending their opponents. Uh, so, okay, they get elected, even if people don't like them. Or just take the last election, 2008. I mean, the core of Obama's funding was financial institutions. Uh, They preferred him to McCain. Uh, They thought he'd serve them better. And it's turning out it's probably true. Uh, You can almost read off the policies of the administration from looking at the concentrated campaign funding. Uh, Financial institutions are doing marvelously. So, yes, taking money out of politics would be a good idea, very good. It's not going to solve all our problems. They're much deeper than that. But it would be substantial. It would be hard because there are all kinds of ways to get around it. But it's an important topic, and 
here tendencies are going in the wrong direction. Uh, right now, the Supreme Court is uh, considering uh, a suit which uh, what it amounts to is uh, uh, allow, if, they, if they approve, if they change the law, which they probably will, it means that corporations can buy elections directly instead of indirectly. <laughs> so that they don't put it that way, but you think through it, that's what it amounts to. So that's what the Supreme Court is doing. Uh, and there's something kind of surreal going on. Because at the very same time, uh, the logic of this for the Supreme Court is that corporations are persons. They have personal rights, so therefore they have the right of free speech. That was, in fact, a, uh, a gift to the corporate world by the courts about a century ago. Uh, conservatives who used to exist, the name does, not the category, bitterly condemned it. They called it a form of communism, a return to feudalism, and so on. But they got it, and by now they have rights way beyond persons. So because they have rights of persons, they have the right of free speech, so therefore they can buy elections directly. At the same time, Congress is... There's a competition going on in Congress between the Democrats and the Republicans to see who can be more brutal in denying health care to undocumented aliens. And there's a legal argument behind that, too. They're not persons under the law. The courts have shaped American law so that if you're an undocumented alien, you're not a person. Uh, you don't have personal rights. So on the one hand, uh, corporate entities are, have rights of persons and have to be allowed to buy elections directly. On the other hand, undocumented aliens on whose backs a lot of the economy rides, they're not persons, and therefore we, the Democrats and the Republicans, have to uh, show that we're more savage than the opposition in denying them health care. We shouldn't be allowing this to happen before our eyes. I mean, the facts are there, but they're not being discussed. There's no, they're not being addressed. And that's another serious lack of people who care about living in a civilized community. Well, um, we've reached the point in our program where we have time for only one last question from our audience, and we'll kind of come back to where we were at the beginning of this discussion with Noam Chomsky. What answer would you give to the frustrated, hardworking people, as you describe them, attracted by the narrative of the right that you listen to brave you on AM talk radio? Well, take the fact that their uh, uh, incomes have stagnated for 30 years, their benefits decline, work hours are going up, and so on. Then, well, suppose they say that's because the government's giving all its all right, money so to... So we should be giving them the right answer. Immigrants. The right answer is that has to do with the reconstruction of the economy that took place in the 1970s, uh, which shifted us from a high-growth, relatively egalitarian economy, the 50s and the 60s, to a financial, to a, what's called a neoliberal economy, with a vast growth of financial institutions, uh, evisceration of productive capacity, uh, shifting it abroad where it's more profitable. And yeah, this uh, has lots of predictable effects. Uh, one of them is the financial crisis, crises that happen periodically. Uh, the growth of the financial institutions is phenomenal, and that doesn't help people. Uh, it's, it, say, in 1970, it was maybe 3% of gross domestic product. Uh, now it's well over 30%. Well, you know, that's great for Goldman Sachs and so on. It's not great for these people who are concerned that their lives are falling apart. Uh, uh, we should tell them that. We should tell them that the heroes, that there is a massive business-run corporate program. Its scale is astonishing. It's been pretty well studied. It goes back to the 1950s. It was designed, as I said before, to make people hate and fear government. But in a, there's a little secret behind it. The people who are running the campaign love government. And they want it to be powerful and interventionist, but in their interest. But what people are told is supposed to hate government. So take, for example, April 15th. Okay, when April 15th comes along, in the comparable date in a functioning democracy, people would be applauding. I say, okay, this is the day in which we get together and 
provide the resources for the programs that we have decided on. What could be better than that? Uh, in the United States, thanks to massive propaganda, you're supposed to hate April 15th because that's the day when some alien force, you know, like from Mars, is coming down here and stealing your hard-earned money. Well, that's a real triumph in undermining and destroying the fundamental basis of democracy. And for elite opinion, you know, for business, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, they don't like democracy. Elites never do. Uh, well, that's our failure to have permitted this to happen. Well, let me also put in a word for media literacy here, because along with the developments you're talking about came deregulation of ownership Absolutely. of radio and television stations, Absolutely. abolition of the fairness doctrine so that radio and television no longer had to provide any balance in their discussion of public issues, and the rise of the talk radio fanatics that have distorted public debate in this country, and television, of course, an entire network. You're right. You're right. I think it's very important. But I, again, I think we should be asking questions about ourselves. Why don't we exploit this situation, make use of it, reach these people with uh, uh, you know, a, a sensible message that can lead them and us to better lives and a more democratic society? Well, got to do that. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of activism in the country. I, I suspect that if you can't no count noses more than in the 60s, but it's a very atomized, isolated society. Uh, people in one corner of town don't know what's happening in the other corner of town. There are separate agendas. There's sectarianism. You know, we got to have our way. You can't have your way. Uh, the success in atomizing the society has been enormous. Uh, and has the one, internet played into that? The, the Internet, I think, has a complicated effect. I mean, it does separate people because you're not... Uh, we're, one thing about human beings is face-to-face -face communication means something. Uh, communicating through uh, you know, uh, a, a text message doesn't have that meaning. So it does separate people. And, in fact, it contributes to the ideal of the business world, which is a society in which the elementary... the the atoms are uh, a dyad, you and the tube, but no communication other than that. That's tremendous technique of control. So it has that effect. On the other hand, it's the, you know, it is the tool for all the organizing and uh, activist uh, act, uh, uh, efforts that go on, and also for education. So it's, you know, it's, the internet really is uh, like a lot of technology. It's fundamentally neutral, depends who's using it and for what purpose. And how class stratified do you think it will continue to be? Do you see any tendencies towards uh, greater participation, people having more access to that technology? No. Well, there's more access, but more access alone doesn't help you. If the access that you have leads to uh, you know, more to a huge range of choices where you have no framework or structure to decide what makes sense, then it's negative. If there's more access that's guided and directed by the kind of understanding and comprehension that can really only come out of cooperative efforts. And education. If, which is a cooperative effort, if it's serious. Uh, yeah, that kind of uh, access makes sense. It's very much like the sciences. I mean, suppose you're, say, a biologist, uh, uh, say the woman who just won the Nobel Prize. Uh, she didn't become a great biologist by reading everything in the biology journals or to kind of randomly picking out things that appeared in the biology journals. I mean, that's, uh, they'll destroy you. Uh, she became a good biologist by having an understanding of what to look for having a framework of comprehension and insight that comes out of cooperative activities. Science is a cooperative activity. Uh, you know, there's occasional people who work on their own, but mostly it's highly interactive, and it lead, it, at best, you know, not always, it does lead to uh, understanding, uh, interchange, uh, communication, improvement of uh, your thinking, directing it better, and yeah, out of that comes a way to kind of wade through the huge mass of information there and find out what's significant. But if all you are trained to care about is your belief system uninstructed by anything yeah. other than tradition, 
you're that's in a different bad. framework. That's very bad. And if what you're trained for from childhood is to pass the next test, it's worse. It destroys your thinking. There's a name for that. It's called No Child Left Behind. Uh, and, uh, which, re- which really means every child left behind. I mean, if that's uh, every one of us is, you know, we've mostly gone to good schools and so on. I'm sure you have the same experience I've had. Uh, you, you, you had to pass an exam, maybe the SATs or whatever it is. So you studied like a maniac. You pass the exam. You forget everything the next day uh, because that's not the way to learn anything. Uh, I was talking to a teacher the other day, actually, while I was here, who, who very, like most teachers, very much opposed to all of this. And she was describing, she has a daughter in the schools. Uh, I forget what grade, but she was telling me that her daughter is in a class where they were studying the Constitution. And the teacher said, meant, told the class, or maybe the book told them, that Georgia didn't participate in the Constitutional Convention. And her daughter came home and told her, she said, you know, I was curious, I want to know why. So I asked the teacher, why didn't Georgia join? And the teacher's answer was, well, we don't have time for that. We've got to get to the next point so that you'll be able to pass the test. And speaking of not having time, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> our thanks very much to Dr. Noam Chomsky. This is a program of the Commonwealth Club of California. For more information about the club and its events, go to commonwealthclub.org. I'm Wendy Hanum, we're a Vice President and General Manager of Link TV, here with a quick and simple message. Expect more. Expect more from your television. You're already watching Link TV, so you know that we don't bombard you with ads that try to sell you something. At Link TV, we offer groundbreaking documentaries and in-depth news. Our goal is to educate, to inspire, and provide context in a complex world, and to give voice to those who otherwise go unheard. We know that you count on us to put issues that matter to you front and center. And now we're counting on you. So why not call the number on your screen, 866-485-8848, or go online to linktv.org slash contribute. It takes less than five minutes, so do it now and help make this winter pledge drive a success. Can't get enough of the program that you're watching right now? Then you are going to love this gift pack that we're offering during this special presentation. Take a look. Contribute $100 today and get your own DVD copy of Noam Chomsky's speech, Who Controls the Message? The New York Times has described Noam Chomsky as arguably the most important intellectual alive today. And now is a great time to add his brilliant speech to your home collection. It even comes with an MP3 file so you can listen to the speech on the go. You'll also receive this classic Link TV tote bag. It's a great reminder to those around you that you really care about independent media. The DVD and the tote are yours for your contribution of $100 today. They also make great holiday gifts, so make sure to order now to get them in time for the holidays. During this year-end pledge drive, we need to raise $300,000. That's right. This is such an important pledge drive for Link, and it's going to help us to continue to bring you great TV right into the new year. So make that call right now. Go to linktv.org slash contribute or call us at 1-866-485-8848. We need every one of our viewers to help keep us going strong. Every donation, big or small, makes a huge impact. So why not consider making a $75 donation? As a token of our appreciation, we're going to send you this back by popular demand Link TV tote bag. This reusable tote is made of sturdy canvas, and it features our distinctive logo. It's perfect to take along to the farmer's market or to the gym. That number again? 1-866-485-8848. Or go to linktv.org and click on that Give Now button. And while you're there, why not consider becoming a sustaining supporter? You choose the amount that's right for you and have your credit card ready to do the rest. It's like adding Link TV to your monthly budget, just as you would a magazine or a newspaper subscription. Choose any amount that works for you and have your credit card ready to do the rest. If you sign up to give $20 or more per month, we're going to send you this fantastic Link TV baseball cap. You know, when you support 
pledge your support for Link, you are also helping yourself at tax time. That's because your contributions are fully tax deductible. So to take full advantage of the year-end tax break, consider making a generous $1,000 contribution today. For that amount, we're going to send you every single gift that we're offering during this pledge drive. That would be a huge addition to any home library. Almost 40 DVDs and books, including hard-to-find documentaries, along with books by Danny Schechter and Amy Goodman. Each one has been handpicked to reflect Link's mission to speak truth to power. And of course, as an added bonus, we'll also be sending you all the great new Link TV gear. So why not order the pack and give the books and DVDs as holiday gifts for those close to you? Not only are you giving the gift of knowledge, but you're giving Link the resources it needs to stay on the air. Donate by December 8th and we're going to get you all of those thank you gifts in time for the holidays. So make that call to 1-866-485-8848 or go online to linktv.org slash contribute. Remember, your contributions make everything you see here possible. Thank you. Link TV, television without borders, on air, online and mobile. For more information or to share your thoughts, visit linktv.org. Since 2002, 470 unionists have been assassinated. This year alone, five unionists have already been killed. Coca-Cola is accused of using paramilitaries to assassinate eight syndicalist Colombians. The allegations are not true. Uno no puede llegar a sindicalizarse porque ya lo buscan es sacarlo. Sí. This is what these workers are up against. It's a collusion between the government working with the paramilitaries and the big corporations to make sure there's no strong labor or human rights movement. The important thing is is the free market and I like Coca-Cola. The Coca-Cola case. Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific on Link TV. You've got an economy now where people are working two jobs. They're coming home, they just barely have enough time to kiss their kid, put their feet up, and what's on television is Bill O'Reilly. It's upon any of us, and particularly our administration uh, and the media, to, to force each other into a higher responsibility. Democracy is no democracy without participation. I think we're on the wrong track. And I think unless we rethink this very, very carefully, uh, we could raise the stakes, invest America's reputation in a greater way, as well as our treasure, and wind up pursuing a policy that is frankly unpursuable, unachievable. Sending more troops to Afghanistan, unfortunately, is going to only result in more dead American soldiers and more dead Afghans. You need to learn from history that there were half a million Soviet troops in Afghanistan and they could not contain the Afghan resistance. Today, we possess neither the wisdom nor the means necessary to determine the fate of the greater Middle East. Rethink Afghanistan. Friday, 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific.
founded People's Grocery in 2002. What we understood was that food is a, a, a critical component to everyone's life. It is both simultaneously intimate and universal to everyone. Initially, our, our goal was to create a grocery store for the community of West Oakland. Uh, it's a community of approximately 30,000 residents. Uh, there's no grocery store at this time for this community. In contrast, there's about 53 liquor stores where many residents do the bulk of their food buying. Our fundamental mission is to create a local food system uh, that supports the health and the economy of the West Oakland community and benefit those who have often been left out of it, namely uh, low-income people, people of color, uh, who are faced with some of the most uh, severe conditions around uh, chronic disease related to diet. Uh, so People's Grocery is really an effort to ensure that uh, a perspective of social justice, of social equity, uh, is, is really at the forefront, what we call food justice, uh, which is really the principle uh, that all people, regardless of economic and social constraints, uh, should have access to the best foods available in our society. Today, in 2008, uh, we have the highest level of hunger that the United States has experienced. Approximately 35 million people are vulnerable to hunger every single day in this country. That is largely a consequence of, of economic disparities, uh, both in terms of income, but also in terms of, of, of how the food system has been structured to become a, a mechanism for wealth creation uh, for those who control the means of production. What we're seeing now is incredible uh, detriments to local economies uh, throughout this country in which large chain big box stores have come in and practically destroyed what we call the old main street and one of the most severe consequences of that is communities like west oakland that do not have big boxes and and in which uh, historically the mom and pop businesses were outcompeted by big boxes and had to close their doors is that we don't have food retail here anymore with the exception of liquor stores and fast food restaurants. Yet we believe that through food, uh, through the culture and the connection that food can bring to land, to traditions of agriculture, uh, to sustainable and organic methods of, of growing in particular, there is an opportunity to begin to regenerate those relationships to nature uh, so that urban consumers can again become uh, connected with the environment and, and, and be a part of the solution for creating a more sustainable world. It's not just the food, it's actually improving the, 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 the health and economic of West Oakland. Um, you know, and having more jobs, more, more good, uh, really well-paying jobs, more businesses, local businesses, um, that sort of thing, so that the, the wealth stays within the communities and it doesn't just go out into um, the corporations, you know, that maybe are there, the businesses that are there, that don't keep the, the money circulated within the community. Uh, People's Grocery is organized sort of into three spheres of activities and programs uh, that interrelate uh, with each other to uh, begin to form a local food system. So some of these basic programs in include our, uh, our adult cooking class, for example, in which we bring uh, adults from the West Oakland community together for six weeks at a time uh, to focus on, on healthy cooking, uh, to, to kind of break some of the, the barriers of, of knowledge or myth around how to prepare healthy foods, how to prepare fresh foods. And it's, a, it's, an, it's an astounding experience where people are coming together not only to learn about uh, how to cook healthy foods, what are whole foods, what are fresh foods, but to really come together in terms of uh, a community, to, to, to bond, to celebrate, to build relationships uh, through this uh, way of sharing and talking about food. Uh, another sphere of our organization is uh, our urban agriculture program. Uh, it's, a, it's a mix of gardens and a farm. We have three community gardens uh, here in West Oakland uh, and a farm in Sonol, which is in the south part of Alameda County. So, um, so I'll come inside and I'll show you what's growing on. This garden is um, part of a larger project to educate the community about uh, using our resources here in the urban areas, um, local, resources that, local resources that we have 
to meet our needs, our, our food needs. So it really brings in just the issues of food security and having access to food and really reducing our, our footprint by, by being able to grow this food locally. And I really feel like food security and having access to food is a basic need for everybody. This is uh, the Sano Ag Park is what it's being called. Uh, we have two acres um, that we're, we're leasing, and the idea is that we want to reconnect people with, with where their food comes from. And so local food is part of that. Less fossil fuels are being used to get the food to uh, the people, and a lot of the farms that are within 150 miles that are bought into a local food system are organic, so we don't use pesticides. We don't, we, we, um, we really are, are trying to take care of the earth and take care of the plants. Um, so the farm produces uh, a variety of produce, seasonal produce that is distributed to the, to the community uh, here in West Oakland, uh, primarily through a program, a produce box distribution program, uh, which is happening here behind me. Um, which uh, is a way of, of bringing fresh foods to residents who traditionally don't have access to them. Uh, because fundamental to this community is finding a way to increase consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables. Many residents are, are relying on heavily processed foods, on packaged foods, and have very little fresh fruit in their diets. I'm also very excited about uh, the notion of sort of creating new models uh, for our future world. Uh, the opportunity to sort of change the direction of the course of what we have assumed to be given to us, uh, meaning that these economic constructs or these market assumptions or, or what is celebrated or prioritized in our society can actually be redefined. Uh, and what we've found in just a few years of doing the work is that even people like us who are, are, are just regular residents, we don't have power, we don't have wealth, uh, we don't have a great degree of sophistication, uh, we can make really meaningful change to, to ignite and inspire a vision of, of what is possible in a different way. And you never know where those seeds really are that will, in 50 or 100 years from now, uh, become the way of life. To learn more about the program you just watched or to share your thoughts, visit linktv.org. Now on Link TV. Our industrial progress and economic growth was fired by what many seem to look on as endless energy. Oil is finite, natural gas is finite, coal, uranium. So there's going to be a peak for all of these and peak oil is just the beginning. Right now we're consuming about five barrels of oil for every one that we discover. I don't see that countries who depend largely on imported oil are thinking about alternative sources of energy. We're flying blind and so we need examples of what's the best way to do it, what's, what's not so good. And Cuba has already undergone a kind of energy famine. From America's tiny neighbor to the south, get a revolutionizing look at life with less oil. Don't miss the power of community, how Cuba survived peak oil, only on Link TV. If you love Link TV, why not become a fan? Visit facebook.com slash Link TV to add us to your fan list. Once connected, talk with others who share your interests and get the latest updates on link programming and initiatives that automatically appear in your personal news feed, making it easy to share important issues with your friends and family. You can visit facebook.com slash linktv to get started. From the director of In Debt We Trust comes a detective story where the victims are punished and the criminals roam free. 
What happened to our economy, our lives, and our future? We need a jailout, not just a bailout. Find out in Plunder, the crime of our...